<laughs> Hello, freak bitches. Makes me cringe and and but but it became like this game of trying to like show that we were going to get our message across no matter what any human being wanted because we knew we were so sure that this was what God wanted. Wow. What made you leave? Uh, a lot of things. It, it started, my very first sort of conscious doubts came from conversations on Twitter. So Wow. I, yeah. Something good got done through yeah. Twitter? Yeah, lots of good things. I also met my husband there. Oh, there you go. While I was still at the church. That's, oh. It's kind of nuts. Is he um, an atheist? Uh, I don't know that he would use that word to describe <laughs> himself. <laughs> Actually, I was just talking to Sam about this, and I was like, when people, the problem with the word is when people, when you say atheist, people think jerk. And like, really? so, well, so, well, so many people do. So many people think that it's like, oh, you're jerk. absolutely certain that there is no God. And so it's, it's a word that I hesitate to use to describe myself too, but, mm. but I'm not a, I'm not a believer. I don't wow. even like to say I'm not a believer because I, I love people. I believe in people and that there is so much hope and, and for people and that we can, I don't know. Anyway, so so conversations that you had on Twitter did what to you? Like what what doors right. did they open in your mind? Right. So I got on Twitter and it was like an extension of the picket line, right? So we right. go out there with these picket signs and you know people would come up to us and ask us questions and so it was this it was a constant uh, a constant conversation. And so I got on Twitter to take that, you know, to to the internet to to reach more people. And so one of the first things I did when I got on Twitter was to attack this Jewish man named David Abbott Ball, who ran a blog called Jewlicious. He was listed as the second most influential Jew on Twitter uh, on this. Uh, Who's number one? Um, I actually can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> not memorable, not part of my story, That's I guess. Okay. But um, you can check it. It's the JTA's list if you want to. It's okay. But anyway, so he was listed as number two. And uh, so he responded initially with, uh, you know, sarcasm and, and, kind of, and hostility. Um, but pretty quickly he sort of changed tactics and started instead of like mocking me, although he still did do that some too. Um, he was asking questions about our picket signs and I started asking him questions about Jewish theology because I, I wanted to better know how to counter it, you know, to, right. from the scriptures. Cause I, I was sure that they were wrong. Jews killed Jesus and, and they reject him as the Messiah. And so all of these things. Um, so, um, Right, so we're having this back and forth, and this goes on for about a year. And during that year, I actually met him twice. I, I protested him twice. Once. So you the, went to his functions, or did, was he giving speeches? Like, yeah. where was he? So in Long Beach, actually, at the Jewlicious Festival, they had this, this Jewish <laughs> cultural festival. What a great name. Yeah, it's great. He, he's great. <laughs> um, so he, right, so I, he was going to be there, uh, and you know, I went and I was protesting him. Uh, and he came out to the picket line and it was, it was one of those like very rowdy pickets. There was a bunch of, uh, counter protesters like, and they were, it was, I don't know, guys dressed as like the Easter bunny and Jesus. And you know, it was actually, it got pretty violent. So I was actually super it got violent. Well, yeah. And the cops, this, I told you we called the cops, like the cops were just standing there watching people like actively assaulting us, like hitting us. And so we're like walking around trying to, you know, to not be hit. Because we're not going to hit back. We weren't. They're, like I said, the church is very against violence. Like they're not going to be violent to people, or defend themselves. Just, just to. So, I was actually really glad when David came out because he became like a buffer between me and the rest of the counter protesters because everybody could tell that he was, you know, he's wearing his delicious shirt and whatever. Anyway, so, so the conversation continued there, and then also at another protest uh, six or seven months later, um, and then. Uh, it was not long after that second protest, he, we're talking again, and he was asking about one of our signs that said "death penalty for fags," and you know, of course, I'm reiterating why the church believes that because in the Book of Leviticus, God calls for the death penalty for gay gays, and and then in Romans one in the New Testament, uh, it's reiterated it says they that commit such things are worthy of death. So, um, and so, so I, I'm telling David these things, and he says. Um, it's like, yeah, but didn't Jesus say, let he who is without sin cast the first stone? And I said, what well, we always said to that, which was, uh, we're not casting stones. We're preaching words. And he said, yeah, but you're advocating that the government cast stones. And I remember, you know, I'm, this is all through Twitter. Mm -hmm. So I, I see this message and I, I kind of gasped and I was like, I had never connected 
that Jesus there, of course he was talking about the death penalty, specifically about the death penalty, and we were advocating it. And so I wasn't sure how to respond, but he, David kept, kept going. He said, and, and what about this member of your church who had a child out of wedlock? And I said, what, what about it? Like, that's, this is another point, you know, people, it was, it was, you know, common knowledge. People knew about this and would throw this in our face. And we would say, the standard of God isn't sinlessness, it's repentance. So she doesn't deserve that punishment because she repented. She stopped, you know, she wasn't having premarital sex anymore. And she knows that it's wrong. And she changed her mind and she changed her conduct, which is what repentance is. And he said, yeah, but she would have been killed if you had instituted the death penalty for that sin. And it was the first time again that I connected that if you kill somebody, as soon as they sin, they, you lose the opportunity to repent and be forgiven. And so again, so I'm, I'm just sort of staring at my phone and, you know, in Topeka, Kansas, he's in Jerusalem. And I really quickly ended the conversation. I don't even remember quite how, but it was just sort of this, like I hadn't, I didn't know how to handle this because like I said, the church is full of lawyers. They're very intelligent and their arguments and their theology for the most part is very well constructed and super consistent. And so for there to be this, you know, this, this hypocrisy, this contradiction, I didn't, my, like my brain was, felt like I was exploding. So I went to a couple people in the church, including my mother. Um, and the response was, feel free to stop me at any time, by the way, I feel like no, I'm filibustering no, here. No, no, um, So she, she's reiterated the same verses that I had told David that, that supported our position, but she didn't address the contradiction. And when I seemed unsatisfied with it, uh, she said I was getting wrapped around an axle and uh, just sort of, you know, push it aside. And the, the response was so just to shut, shut me down uh, mm -hmm. and then to move on to the next thing, which is it's a very human thing, right? When somebody puts something in your face that, that is this contradiction that you're not ready to deal with or that you can't, it, it, you, you, you know what I mean? You compartmentalize, yeah. you kind of sort of push it aside and try not to. So the way that I dealt with it was to uh, stop holding the sign because I knew that if somebody asked me about it, I... I couldn't defend it because I didn't, I didn't believe it, but there was nothing else I could do at that point. And, but the importance of that conversation, this is obviously just one small contradiction, one small inconsistency and a vast, you know, we still, I still believed that everybody outside the church was basically completely wrong and, and evil and, or delusional and that the church was basically right, except this one point. It's a culture of tattletales, not out of bad intention, but because they believe that it, they're trying to help you. Right. They don't want you to go down a bad path. So, so, you know, when I, it was, it was the, I first thought of leaving on, it was July 4th and I was with my sister at the time. And when it first occurred to me that I might, that I might have to leave the church or that the church might be wrong, I thought I had to leave like that second because if it even occurred to me that meant I didn't belong there and that God was going to punish me and that I, I just felt like just immediately so much guilt and like I was a betrayer. But was all your social life connected still to the church? Yeah. And was this where, had you already known your husband by then? I, I had, yeah. So he corrupted you. He was definitely part of it. <laughs> uh. So, but like, it, it wasn't like that. It's so like the beginning, like, so, so he was just another person on Twitter at first. Um, and and it was, it was, it was like friendly conversation. And this went over the, you know, for the course of several months. Um, I don't know, eight, eight or eight months or so, seven or eight months. Uh, and then, and it was never, and there was never anything, you know, about feelings or, you know, relationships or all that stuff is totally Booty forbidden. Pictures. No, nothing like that. Like <laughs> not even like, not even anything like nothing. Like it's just that I, I my right. mind didn't work that way. Not, there is, there can be no relationship like that with outsiders, but Outsiders. I, outsiders. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, and you, I, I actually thought I was never going to get married because most of the people in the church, about 80% or so of the people in the church, there's only 80 people or so anyway, were my immediate and extended family. So oh, I thought, no. there's no way that I'm going to, I'm just not going to get married. So you just accepted kids. that? It was, it wasn't, it wasn't like an, like an easy thing at first, but it was just, it was just the facts on the ground, you know, like I, I So the facts on the ground were you had to date someone inside the church. There was only 80 people in the church. They're all your family. You can't date your family. Fuck. Yeah. 
Wow. I mean, I should say there were a couple of people my age who like, and they can't, they had just joined the church, like, you know, that, but I had no, like, I had no interest in any of them. And oh, no. no Slim was... pickings and not, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it was kind of strange, but I, so I actually had a dream about meeting. So, and I should say also my husband at the time, I didn't know he was totally anonymous on Twitter. Like so it's just his words. I didn't know what he looked like. I didn't know, you know, his name or where he lived or anything about him, uh, except except these words. Um, and he was uh, he was just curious and kind and and that sort of and he loved people and so he would sort of always be pushing pushing the conversation back to. It's like I'm giving it, which like I've told you all those verses about protesting funerals and why we have to go and do this and the importance of it and why we have to thank God for these tragedies because mm-hmm. God is sovereign and he's in control. So I'm, I'm talking about the, I'm scripturally like the justifying all these things. And he kept pushing it back to, cause he's not he's super well-versed in the Bible. Um, so he didn't know how to, he's like, I, I see that the Bible says these things, but what about the family? Like, I just cannot imagine going and doing these things to, to people. And so this is all happening like on as I'm so I'm also still having conversations on Twitter with so many other people. So it's like Twitter became this like empathy machine for me. Like so it's not just like on a picket line where people are butting heads and, you know, arguing and debating and and yelling. And it's I'm yes, having these they can be kind of aggressive conversations, but I'm also seeing like photos of their cats and them you know, exchanging, you know, joking with their friends. And so I'm seeing a side of people and sort of being immersed in this community in a way that I had never been before. And so it was really, it's like, I'm trying to say, like, when you say, why did you leave? Like there's, it took, it was so much sort of happening, you know, around this time. So when, by the time this like pile up of things, um, you know, and I'm processing it as I'm going through this. I'm also talking to my sister, uh, and and she was the only, and other people in the church. But she was the only person. If I ever had a doubt or a, or a question or a like, if I thought we're doing something wrong here, she was the only person who would say, "Yeah, you're right. That doesn't make sense." That I should say, my sister is um, creative and artistic, and had a like a little bit of a reputation for being kind of rebellious, not as like submissive as my, me and, and our other sister. Um, so it was this, this dynamic of, uh, you know, between the two of us where she was the only person I could fully articulate my thoughts and feelings to. Um, and so when I first thought of leaving and I turned around and I thought, I literally, it was, we were painting at a friend's house, painting the walls. And I, I turned around to set my paintbrush down. I thought I had to go and leave that second. And I turned around and saw my sister, and uh, I thought I can't leave without talking to her. So the next day, I um, she came home from work over the you know lunch hour, and we would always like go up to my room and we were talking about all these doubts we were having. And I was crying, and I put my head in her lap, and and I couldn't even art like articulating the idea of leaving was too much. Like it, it's it's terrifying. Um, and it, it's just seemed like impossible. And I said, um, what if we weren't here? And she said, what do you mean? And I said, what if we were somewhere else? And so it, that starts this conversation where, you know, I cannot let go of all the things that I thought that the church was doing wrong, that our, our where our theology was wrong, where we were applying it wrong. I mean, in a way that, that was destructive and unscriptural. Um, and she kept pushing the conversation back to we're never going to see our family again we're going to lose everyone and everything that's ever been important to us there is no hope outside this church all the things that we had learned about outsiders that you know that they were evil and they they could never truly love each other or care about care about one another they're really just enabling one another on the path to hell so and so this this back and forth you know goes on for about four months before we finally actually left and uh, it was as, as bad or worse as than I could have imagined. But to get back to the... Well, let's get to that. Yeah. Bad or worse you could have ever imagined. So what, I should... Oh, so you left. How did you leave? Uh, 
was, we were talking to my parents and, you know, and it was another, another issue had come up and I, I couldn't, we couldn't, it was a battle that we weren't going to fight again. We, we, we kept, I should say in those four months, I kept trying to, to articulate these doubts in a way that the church would accept, like trying to convince them, not being as open, like, but as time went on, I became more and more open about, about these questions and doubts. Um, and I, I just, I, I couldn't, we couldn't fight it anymore. I just looked at Grace and I said, we have to go. And cause we, and I should say also, we had already been packing. Like we had, we had started packing our things about a little over a month before that. And we had started like taking boxes to our friend's house. Um, and with the understanding, he's actually our, he was our high school English teacher, um, that we had kept up with on Twitter. And he, you know, I, we basically told him, you know, if something changes, if the church changes and these things get better, uh, then we'll, t- we'll take all our stuff back and just pretend like none of this ever happened. And he was just, you know, understanding and compassionate and, and really supportive. Um, but so we had done all this stuff already, but we actually had to go and pack the rest of our things. So we walked out of our parents' bedroom and went and started packing and you know people started coming my brother and some of the elders and my aunt my cousin you know people i i I, we were very close like our whole my whole life revolved around the church and so to look these people in the face and say that you know this the you know the us them mentality it, it the bonds that are created in environments like that are incredibly strong at least they were in our church and again, most of these people are also my family, um, so it was it was awful. Uh, and I'm tr- you know crying and packing and trying to explain to them why why we're leaving. And I can hardly talk, you know, be just just I was so overwhelmed. But um, we actually had to go back the next day with a U-Haul to get the rest of our stuff. Our our parents helped us pack. It's not it's not one of those. Uh, like there are some or groups like that where they don't want you to leave. They'll they'll try to stop you from leaving. Like I heard um, the Scientology, the Miscavige, yeah. the I can't remember his first, Ron. Ron. Yeah, he was talking about like phys, like actual um, obstacles to you leaving. Like physically, like they're not gonna you can't get out of the gate. Like right. nothing like that. You know, my they always would say this is a volunteer army, and if you don't want to be here, then you don't belong here. So it's just the uh, it's the threat of losing everything and everyone Alienation. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah being ostracized by and just sort of expelled into this world that you believe and have always believed is is evil and without hope and doomed so how did you do it how did like you you got all your stuff packed people are coming in mm-hmm. they're saying yeah i mean like they're 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 trying to convince us but once they understand that we're not being convinced that that you know they they walked away so I mean, our, that night our dad dropped us off at a hotel, and then Jesus Christ. Yeah, like it's 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 so immediate that you become this, you become other, you become an outsider. Like in the next morning when we went back, I rang the doorbell. I rang the doorbell to your own house, and I lived in that house from the day I was born. Whoa! So and, you felt like you had to ring the doorbell. Mm-hmm. Like this is not my world anymore. Yeah. Wow. Grace was like, "Why did you ring the doorbell?" And it was like, "There's there's no other." There's, there is nothing else. Like it's, this is not our home. This is not. So we go and you know we're packing all of our things. It was just, it was awful. Just, a, I had been in those four months. I had been so terrified of, because I know knowing what was coming. Like just imagine you're going to lose everyone in your life. That they're just, you're just going to like, you're not gonna like how your parents met and fell in love, or like your grandparents and family recipes and photos and memories and what did the house look? So I'm like taking photos and voice recordings and just all the time, like in every, it was just, it's just, it's overwhelming. It's just. Wow. Um, so let's go back to your first job. What was it? <laughs> what was the first job? Um, I worked at a. Um, very briefly like so i should say my sister and i we were in it was a couple months before i actually got a job um we spent the first month with um a cousin of mine who had left the church a few years earlier she lived really close she had left as well yeah so you guys knew some people had made it out right but like the thing is it there's there's so many my sister calls them mind fucks right so like the thing about people who leave is that they are demonized more than anybody else like even more than gays or jews or any other outsider it's ex-members who get the worst 
you hear the worst things about them because wow. they knew the truth and they rejected it, right? So I was when it came, when it, when I thought of leaving, like the last thing on my mind was that I could go to an ex member. I thought you can't trust them; they're right. evil. Like so, it's it's just this whole um, there's intensely negative, instinctive reactions to to those things. But obviously, I overcame it, and I reached out to her a few weeks before we left, and she was amazing. Like within, I hadn't talked to her in three and a half years, and had said all kinds of terrible things, you know, about her um, after she left. But um, but she was wonderful. Uh, and she said like within like 30 seconds of like when I when she understood that I was you know planning to leave uh, I want you to come live with me and wow. it was it was amazing and uh, so kind and so I lived there for about a month um, my sister was still in school so she was we were traveling back to can to Topeka sorry it's like so it's a half an hour from my cousin's house you know four days a week while she was still in school and so we, but we were constantly running into our family and driving by the pickets because they picket every day in Topeka several times a day and uh like at the grocery store and on campus and so it was just we needed to get away so we ended up going to Deadwood South Dakota um my brother had been a fan of the tv show and uh <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it just seemed like a a nice quiet like place so how many people went with you it was you your sister and your brother it, n no it's just just you and your sister me and my sister yeah did anybody else join you after a while i have a brother who left uh, about a year and a half after my sister and i did wow. and i have another brother who left about eight years before i did wow mm -hmm. so now there's seven there's 11 kids so seven are still at home and four of us are out <sighs> Do you talk to them? Yeah, the, the the people who are out. Yeah. What about the people that are in? No, they they won't have anything to do with us. Wow. It's just like I talk to your mom. No. No. Uh, sh they. I. But the thing is, like, so back to Twitter. Like, that's how I know what they up, what they're up to. Like, I, I see photo. Like, they post photos. Like, I'm I've been watching my little brothers grow up on through photos on Twitter and, you know, see what my parents, what How my mom hard is saying. That? It's awful. I mean, it's, it's, I'm glad, I'm so glad to be living now and not, you know, before social media where I can actually see these things and, and know what they're up to and, and a little bit about how they're do doing. Do you want to reach out? I, I do. You do? Yeah. I mean, I do on, on Twitter, it, you know, this is great about Twitter. Um, sometimes like I have, they blocked me on my main account. Um, they block you? Not all of them, but. A lot of them. Did your mom block you? Uh, she actually created, she she got kicked off of Twitter at one point, so she had to create a new account. <laughs> so she didn't block me on her new account yet. Um, but like she uh, blocked you in her old account? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's um, deep. Yeah. Like when the, your mom blocks you on Twitter, it's that's a, It's intense. a big thing, right? When it's you really look terrible. and you see that you're blocked, what is that? What is that lump in your throat like? Just what you'd imagine. Like, it, I, I can't believe, like, it, it's so hard to think back to, like, I was incredibly close with my mom, and I, I love her, and I miss her. Like, I, I'm, I used to make coffee for her every morning, and, like, we'd go on walks together, and we'd when walk When was the last time you spoke to her? Um, well, actually, I I saw her at a picket a little over a year ago. She Jesus. didn't She didn't say anything to me. She didn't even talk to you? No, she, she couldn't. Like, a baby that came from her body, loved you and raised you she can't like it, it's there it's it's so like when I think about like when I was at the church and this is one of the hardest things to articulate I mean to that the feeling of like when somebody leaves like there is no interaction so some people would ask like well what if you saw her at such a place you know wherever at the grocery store or whatever like what what would you say they would ask me this while I was still at the church and it, it, it's so it's like uh I, the only thing I can compare it to is like, it's like dividing by zero. Like the situation does not exist. Like there's nothing there. The idea of trying to talk to her, it, it, it is impossible. Right. And, and that's so crazy. That's the cult. That's yeah, the cult exactly. part for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's the, like in Jehovah's witnesses, they call it a uh, disfellowshipping. Right. Yeah. They all have it. Excommunication. Scientology has mm -hmm. it. They all have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one of the ways they control people. The fear of alienation is incredibly strong. And the fear of becoming strong. like them. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So they'll talk to gay people. They'll talk to people with rainbow shirts on. Mm -hmm. They'll talk to ex-soldiers. They'll talk to those people. Mm -hmm. They won't talk to you. Right. That's insane. But this is... Uh, one get of, your mono acid. Why not? <laughs> <a> doser. <laughs> um, one of the, like... 
great things about Twitter and and I just the internet in general is that it's a thing where so like they obviously like my little brothers for instance like they are you know hearing all this bad stuff about you know my sister and me anybody who leaves they all, they'll hear bad things about us but the good thing about the internet is that they can go on they can go to my Twitter account and see what I'm actually saying so it, I'm still I go through these phases where like I I I, I will tweet and then I get like I, I can't I just like the the fear of judgment I guess for my family and I just I just choose to focus on other things and not post things on Twitter but like I still I follow them on this other account that I created that's not blocked right and it's just WBC accounts so like and I see like things that they say and uh, like doctrines that I now believe are unscriptural and so like I will tweet them you know verses like that I what this contradicts you like and try to like basically doing what I was doing for them now against them like just in this right in these instances and and so there is some engagement a little bit with my family on twitter because especially because of any like anything that i do publicly so maybe something about this i don't know but like when my ted talk came out there was a couple of articles and like people were tweeting it a lot and and uh so my uncle and my aunt both were tweeting tweeting me and tweeting about me and so I was, you know, we're having this repartee, I guess, like just, you know, going back and forth about these, these Bible verses and, and debating. And so all of that stuff is, it's, it's, I, I hope, well, at some point, hopefully we'll have, we'll have some effect. And in some ways it, it already has. So like the day that I left, there was a, we're going to get to that job sometime soon. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. The day um, that you left. The day that I left, my one of my cousins, you know, came into my bedroom while I was crying and packing, and I was asking, like, just very calmly, like, this is my best, my best friend. She was a year older than me, is a year older than me, and uh, she's asking me why we're leaving, and I'm describing a lot of things, and one of the, I described specifically two signs. Uh, one of them was the death penalty for fags, and another one was fags can't repent, and uh, she sent me a message the next morning and like I, I was describing verses that I thought, you know, contradicted those two signs. And, uh, the following morning she sent me a message, a text message super early in the morning, just like, uh, just chewing me out basically like that, that I know that, that Leviticus and Romans one, like the death, death penalty, like there's no, there's, you have no argument. Like, so, so what's your, really your problem? And, uh, so, and then for a while after I left, like those signs were like everywhere. Like she's holding my cousin changes her profile picture on Twitter to her holding those two signs, like screaming into the camera and like yeah. one of the elders, like making a snow angel with those two signs. And it's like, so they're just like doubling down on this. Right. And uh, so this goes on. It's like during this time, like I'm talking about it in like giving a few interviews, like talking about it there, like on Twitter a little bit, um, like reiterating the verses that contradict them. And then, like, after more than two years, like, I wake up one morning and I check, you know, I'm checking their Twitters. And uh, there was a blog post and they said, uh, about that fags can't repent sign. And I was like, oh, my God. So I, like, opened the blog post and it's, uh, for the first time ever, they had publicly disavowed a sign. And using the what? same Bible verses that I had been. And I know that's just like a, a very small point. That's you know, huge. In the grand scheme of things, right? But That's, that's reason. That's critical reasoning. Mm. But, but like, so this is, this wow. is the goal, right? So like to knowing this is like, what Who, I, do you, do you yeah. know the story behind it? I don't, I don't. It was after my, my brother left. So I don't really know, you know, nobody, the, nobody who's left since then. I also have, I have two, two actually of my cousins have left since then also. Um, but none of them have any understanding of like, of, of what happened. So I don't know. I, and I'm not, I, I'm not trying to take credit. I should also say like. It well, doesn't matter. It yeah. doesn't matter. Like it What's just what matters is that it's, it, this idea gets possible. into their yeah. This yeah. idea gets into their head that what they're doing, it's this is not in any way the teachings of Christ. Right. I mean, like the thing is, like some some of it is. <laughs> some of it.